All right, welcome everyone. Um, we are doing the Brooks Pierce webinar on navigating mental health under the ADA, FMLA, and workers' compensation laws. Uh, today, we will also be taking questions through the chat, so please feel free to use that. And at this point, I will let our speakers, Sarah Saint and Patricia Goodson, introduce themselves. Thank you. Hey, I am Trisha Goodson. I'm an attorney with Brooks Pierce, and we are glad y'all are here today. We are going to be talking about navigating mental health under the ADA, FMLA, and workers' compensation laws. Sometimes this is referred to as the three-headed monster, these three um, statutes and how they work together. Um, so we have a few administrative notes um, on the next slide which is just that the content of the webinar is provided for general information purposes only and shouldn't be considered legal advice or a substitute for consulting attorney. And, but if you have questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to submit those in the chat. We'll take them as we go, or we might address them at the end as appropriate. Um, this presentation is also approved for SHRM credit, or SHRM credit and there'll be a code available. Um, actually, I don't know that we have the code just yet, um, if we get it during the presentation, we'll put it in the chat. Otherwise, we will send out an email with that code. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Sarah for her to introduce herself. Hey, everybody. So, so if you'll go to the next slide for us. Um, my name is Sarah Saint. I'm an attorney at Brooks Pierce out of our Greensboro office. Um, and I litigate a wide variety of employment law issues, especially those related to uh, disputes over these three laws um, and how they uh, interact with one another and um, leave and accommodations and all the things that a lot of us are thinking about related to mental health these days. Uh, and my background is actually in counseling. And so very much so care a lot about um, the mental health issues that are impacting employees and then also what employers are supposed to do in the wake of all of those. So if you'll go to our next slide, we have, um, as I'm sure many of y'all are experiencing in your workplaces, there are a lot of mental health concerns that are going on in America these days. Um, at least 50% of our population, the CDC says, will be diagnosed with a mental health condition during their lifetime. And considering the number of years of our lifetime that are spent in the workforce, 50%, I would say, of your employees are going to face a mental health condition at some point. Uh, and I think we've all experienced over the past several years through the pandemic uh, that those concerns have risen to the surface uh, in, in mass. And so it's a very timely issue right now. Uh, so you'll go to the next slide. Um, there are a lot of challenges when we're dealing with mental health as a disability. Some people don't come forward with their mental health concerns because of stigma. Um, some people don't seek treatment because um, of how they were raised or stigma. It's also, they're not very obvious. You know, if somebody comes to us and they use a wheelchair, that's very obvious. But somebody dealing with depression, not nearly as obvious. And it's also a lot harder to discern what sorts of things somebody may need if they have a mental health disability. Um, they're much harder to generalize than some physical disabilities. So there are three laws that we are going to focus on today. Um, the first one is our Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, the big one that came about in 1990. And then we also have the Family Medical Leave Act and workers' compensation laws. And as Tricia said, this is a three-headed monster. And if you take nothing else away from this presentation, remembering to think about all three issues at the same time is the most important thing because usually every single one of them is implicated in some way and it's important to do an analysis um, each time you're thinking about one of them that you're thinking about all three of them. So the first law um, is the ADA. 
The ADA is a law that prevents discrimination. It's an anti-discrimination law against disabled employees uh, who can perform the essential functions of the job with or without reasonable accommodations. So Celia, if you'll go to our next slide, um, those are two really important phrases. They must be able to perform the essential functions and then with or without reasonable accommodation. And so it's important for employers to keep in mind as they're thinking through the rest of the ADA requirements, what are the essential functions uh, of, any, of any job? And then also what might be a reasonable accommodation? And we're gonna dive more into that as that relates to mental health disabilities. Uh, but the EEOC, has spoken quite loudly recently uh, that they're paying attention to mental health related disabilities. Um, there is a recent lawsuit that resulted in companies having to pay over $100,000 uh, due to not uh, providing appropriate leave um, of, under the ADA. And we're gonna dive into when leave may or may not be required under the ADA. Um, but the EEOC is definitely paying attention to these issues, uh, definitely enforcing the ADA as it relates to mental health disabilities, not only physical disabilities. So ADA disabilities, as I'm sure many folks on this webinar know, are include physical disabilities as well as mental impairments, um, mental impairments that substantially limit a major life activity. Uh, the ADA is interpreted broadly, that this, the definition of disability is a broad one, and it's it's meant to be broad one, a broad one. Mental impairments can include everything from depression to panic attacks to PTSD, um, even to gender dysphoria. Uh, the Fourth Circuit, which is the circuit court that um, is over North Carolina, as well as South Carolina and Virginia and West Virginia and Maryland, uh, recently came out with a decision that said gender dysphoria is included within mental impairments under the ADA. So that would include transgender employees who are um, who have been diagnosed with gender dysphoria may also be entitled to ADA accommodations as well. So it, it includes a whole lot of different kinds of mental impairments. Uh, and this mental impairment must substantially, so if you go back one, please, uh, it must substantially limit um, someone's major life activity meaning it's got to it's got to seriously impact them um but the major life activities again are broad it is everything from thinking to concentrating to walking to working and working is very explicitly listed um, under the ada list of what are major life activities so if a mental illness substantially impairs someone's ability to work then they meet the definition of having an ADA disability. And we have to look at, do we need to accommodate them or not? And then if so, what would be a reasonable accommodation? All right, so now I'm ready for the next slide. Um, so I said before, mental health conditions can be disabilities and we need to look at that closely. Um, the ways that they substantially impact somebody at work though, and Cecilia, if you'll go to our next slide, um, they can impact in a wide variety of ways, right? It can be anything from uh, the ability to sustain concentration um, to maintaining stamina. People with uh, depression have a hard time, could have a hard time working a whole day, um, or maybe they have taken medication that causes them to be drowsy. Um, some people with mental health disabilities struggle with time pressures, um, either because of anxiety or because um, of a neurodivergent that impacts their executive functioning. Uh, sometimes it can impact their ability to get along with others. And that's an important component of the workplace as well. Uh, it can impact people's ability to respond to negative feedback in a professional or a constructive way. Um, it can also impact people's ability to respond to change. Somebody with anxiety could really struggle with responding to change. Somebody with autism could really struggle with responding to change. Um, so the, the reasons why someone may have these difficulties uh, can be very different, but it can impact the workplace in a lot of different ways um, that many of us don't always think about, um, in, including screening out environmental, stimu environmental stimuli. Um, the ability to block out things that are going around you uh, so that you can focus on your work is another thing that can be impacted by a mental health disability. So the question that we always get is, okay, I get that. Now, what do I do about it? What, what am I supposed to do in these situations? Um, so step one is you got to know about the disability. 
employers are only required to accommodate known disabilities. So sometimes, like I, we said about the person who uses a wheelchair, that one can be known just by them coming to your office. You know that they have a disability. But with mental health disabilities, generally they have to be disclosed in some sort of way. It's not, they're not things that you can see as easily. Um, and then if someone does disclose their accommodation, they or does disclose their disability, they don't have to use magic words. They don't need to come to you and say, hey, I have depression and it substantially limits my major life activity of working. Um, they just need to tell you something that reveals that they have this disability. Um, and then from there, the employee has the onus of requesting, again, some sort of accommodation. Uh, again, if it's an obvious thing, right, somebody using a wheelchair, it's known that if they are not able to go up and down steps, so we'll, it's known that they may need an accommodation there. Um, but again, with mental health disabilities, it's not easy to know what sort of accommodation somebody may need, if they need one at all. Um, plenty of people have mental health disabilities and need no accommodation whatsoever to do their work. Plenty of people have mental health disabilities and do need accommodation. Um, and so there needs to be some sort of request for um, assistance, accommodation. Again, there aren't magic words here though. The employee is not expected to know that they need to um, come to a supervisor and say, hey, I have an ADA disability and I need a reasonable accommodation. It can be a lot lower um, than that. So they may say, I have a medical condition and I need to take breaks every two hours. That is a request for a reasonable accommodation. Or they may come to you and say, I've been having these emotional problems and I mean, they may need some time off in, in order to go to my counseling appointments. Or I have this chemical imbalance and it impacts my energy level sometimes. And so sometimes I need to take time off to go receive medical treatments for that. All of these things are ways someone may request a reasonable accommodation without using words, I need a reasonable accommodation. And so at that point, that's when the onus turns to the employer. That's where our job is triggered, where we need to start thinking through, okay, this person has come to me, revealed a disability and a need for an accommodation. Let's think about what to do. Um, and it's supposed to be a really interactive process between employer and employee. The employer is not required to give the employee what they ask for, but they are required to think through what would be effective. Um, and so that's that's the goal of the conversation. So um, I always advise employers to be creative, to come at it with an open mind. Um, the person who has the disability, they understand their disability uh, better than they're better than we do. And especially when it comes to mental health disabilities, um, the way they impact is just so different. Somebody with depression may uh, have low energy levels where somebody else with depression may have a hard time receiving feedback. And so they would need different sorts of accommodations depending on how it impacts them. There are also um, specialists who do this kind of work all the time. So if this is something you've never faced before, uh, the EEOC has a lot of good uh, resources on their website of people that you can call in to help you through this process, um, especially if it's one of your first times, as well as um, attorneys can help you with this as well. Um, and it's important that this interactive dialogue is well documented. First, that you had it, um, that you invited the employee to come do it. Um, if the employee refuses to have it, it's important that that's documented. And it's important to document what it is that you talked about. You know, they suggested this, and we suggested that, and then we talked about this, and we agreed upon this. Having all of that written down is really important. Um, if by chance you wind up and, and you and I end up hanging out some more and we're in litigation, that's an important piece of um, evidence for us to have to make sure that we can show that an interactive dialogue happened. Um, and so during this dialogue, the goal, like I said, is that you're trying to determine what accommodation is going to be effective here. What is something that would enable them to do their job, uh, whether it is time off or reduced uh, a, a shift in their schedule or noise canceling headphones or um, sending an email that lays out concerns before having a conversation about what those concerns are, whatever it is, just trying to figure out what accommodation would be effective. Don't think about whether it's reasonable yet. Sky's the limit. Think about what is it that would be effective and then try to see from there 
can you get it to a reasonable place? Because again, employers are only required to give reasonable accommodations, not any and every accommodation. Um, if an accommodation imposes an undue hardship on an employer, then that would not be considered a reasonable one. So if somebody says, well, I you know, can't come to work four out of five days a week for the next three years, that might be an undue hardship on the employer to only have that employee in the office once a week for the next three years. Um, cost, though, is um, there's a higher threshold of what a what the EEOC believes an unreasonable cost would be, an undue hardship um, in terms of money. Uh, so it's important to consult an attorney if, if there's a cost situation here. But generally speaking, um, accommodations can usually be worked out that it'll be reasonable for the employee, effective for the employee, that don't impose an undue hardship on the employer, but it does require some creativity sometimes. Um, so like I said, reasonable accommodations are ones that do not change the essential functions of the job. So it's really, really important to make sure that you know what those essential functions are. Um, I'll use my, my job as an example. Um, it, it would not be an essential function of my job to be able to lift 50 pounds. I don't ever lift 50 pounds in my job, but a lot of job descriptions have some sort of like weight requirement um, on them. So if my job description did, that may not be an essential function of my job. And if that's something that I can't do for whatever reason, then it wouldn't be an undue hardship for me not to be able to do that. But um, an essential function of my job is the ability um, for me to, to go to court and argue. And so if there are, if that would be totally taken off the table by my disability and there is no accommodation to enable me to do that, then um, that then there may not be a reasonable way for me to stay in my job. And so it's important to think through what truly are the essential functions. And so it's going to be situation specific and job dependent um, to determine what those are. Um, and then if somebody is able to do those with a reasonable accommodation, then great, we can give it to them. Um, but if they're not able to do those essential functions, then there's not a requirement to accommodate. So some examples of reasonable accommodations to get your, your wheels spinning. Um, it can be, I mean, as you can see on this list, there is a lot of different things um, that can be considered a reasonable accommodation for mental health disabilities. It could be a change in work schedule if someone is dealing with disrupted sleep. It can be some leave, and we're going to talk a lot about leave in a little bit, so I'll hold on to that one. Um, it can be some job restructuring, delegating those non-essential functions, you know, taking the 50-pound lift off my plate and giving it to somebody else. Um, remote work can be a reasonable accommodation. Uh, and we have another webinar that talks a whole lot about remote work, uh, but the EEOC has said that remote work could be a reasonable accommodation um, if needed. Modified supervision can also be good, both more supervision and change supervision. So some people may need more regular check-ins, that could be a reasonable accommodation, or some people may need, um, like I said before, a need for somebody to email them in advance uh, to provide them feedback so they have a time to digest it, sit with it, and then the next day have a conversation about it. Um, job coaches can be a reasonable accommodation. People with executive functioning disorders can really benefit from having a job coach. Uh, changing policies, allowing someone to wear headphones, if that's not something that is allowed in the workplace or taking more breaks. Um, educating others can be a reasonable accommodation. We're going to talk about confidentiality. Um, so if you're going to be educating others about someone's disability, it's very important that you do so in a way that upholds their confidentiality. Um, and then also a transfer to a vacant position can be a reasonable accommodation. So some modification examples. Some of these I listed. Um, but a lot of these have to do with changing the environment. Um, sometimes people get migraines from the fluorescent lights. So changing the lighting for them can be a reasonable accommodation. Or like I said, a headset, either one that doesn't have music if somebody um, needs to focus more or somebody that, that needs to listen to music in order to focus. That may not be your workplace culture, that may not be your workplace policy, but if it's something that enables them to get their work done, that can be a reasonable accommodation um, for folks. 
There's also equipment and technology, reasonable accommodations. Um, anything from a white noise machine, especially for people that work um, in louder offices or people who are in cubicles, um, sometimes that can be really helpful. Having a tape recorder, you know, somebody may have a hard time keeping, you know, mem remembering what happens in a meeting. And so having a tape recorder and allowing them to record the meeting to go back and listen to that later uh, can be helpful. It's a lot of really great computer software now too that can be really helpful. Things that limit access to um, different websites or that minimize pop-ups um, or that you don't get the email alert that pops up all the time can really be helpful for people that have attention um, focused disabilities. Modifying people's jobs could also be a reasonable accommodation. Um, anything from additional coaching and training to dividing up large assignments into smaller tasks. Um, you know, maybe somebody has a disability where having, you know, uh, I need you to do this whole project is something that they're they're not able to do that and to split it up into individual tasks. But if you split it up into individual tasks for them, they can do every single one of the tasks and produce an incredible project at the end. That can be a reasonable accommodation where the essential function is the product, right? We need them to produce this product at the end of it. Splitting up the task is not necessarily an essential function. Somebody else can do that for them. And then once they do, they're off to the races and ready to go. So there's a lot of, like I said, there's a lot of ways to be very creative in the way that we think about what can be a reasonable accommodation. Um, the sky's the limit, really, especially with mental health disabilities. There's just so many different ways um, to accommodate those things. And they don't cost very much or take very much time from an employer uh, to do this. It's just maybe a shift in the way that we think about things. However, not every accommodation is reasonable. Lowering quality of work or quantity of work, not necessarily a reasonable accommodation. Um, eliminating essential function of a job, not a reasonable accommodation. Um, excusing misconduct, uh, there is no reasonable accommodation that allows somebody to steal money out of your company bank account. Um, you don't have to excuse misconduct, but think about if it really is misconduct, like the music thing. There's some workplaces that don't allow any headphones because they think that that intrudes on the culture of the workplace. Um, that's not misconduct though. So that, so it could be a reasonable accommodation to allow somebody to use headphones. Um, Creating a new job, giving a new supervisor, um, an indefinite leave is also an unreasonable accommodation. Leave that's like, well, I don't know how long I'm going to need it. Could be a month, could be 12 months. I'm not sure. Um, that's not a reasonable accommodation either. So again, not every accommodation is reasonable, but there are a lot that, that most employers and employees can agree on. If an accommodation is given, though, it is really important to remember that that is not an excuse for meeting performance expectations. And so in that conversation, in that interactive dialogue, once it's decided, okay, we can provide a reasonable accommodation and this is what it's gonna be, it's also really important to remind the employee of the expectations for their performance and what their responsibilities are. It's also important to have some sort of process to evaluate the accommodation. Is it still effective? Is it still working? Um, and then lastly, it's important to remember the safety of others. There is not a reasonable accommodation that requires us to put other employees at risk of being harmed. Um, so that, that would be an unreasonable accommodation if somebody is going to be at risk um, of being harmed. So remember these things if you're going to give an accommodation. All right. And Trisha, I will turn it over to you to handle the second head of our three-headed monster. Sure. And I'm just going to add two quick notes about the ADA um, and accommodations. If, as Sarah said, if you uh, do provide an accommodation, it's not a replacement for meeting performance, but if you have, uh, as a reasonable accommodation, given somebody a leave of absence, just remember that if you have commissions or other things that are based on like a year or a quarterly production, you may need to consider prorating for the time they were absent because the absence should not be counted against them. And that would also include if you have like a no-fault attendance policy, you can't use uh, an approved accommodation leave at, against them on an attendance policy either. So just keep that in mind when you're looking at performance. If the leave is what you're really 
disciplining them for then then um or if it was created by the leave then you need to rethink that um performance expectation for them so uh, as we move on to the Family Medical Leave Act, so this one is, um, in some ways, it, it's simpler because it is about leave, but as y'all probably all know that have worked with the FMLA, it is an intricate statute and regulations with lots of steps where you have to cross your T's and dot your I's. But overall, FMLA provides job-protected leave. Um, and so it does not require all the accommodations and interactive process that the ADA does. Um, but looking specifically here at mental health conditions, um, that can be a reason for FMLA leave. And so an eligible employee could take FMLA for their own serious health condition or to care for a spouse, child, or a parent because of a serious health condition. There are other reasons as well under the FMLA where someone could qualify for leave, but these are the two that really will be impacted with mental health conditions. So for FMLA, you have to provide up to 12 work weeks of FMLA each year. And I say up to because the employee may not need 12 weeks of, of leave. And then also each year, and that is a calendar year or a rolling year, depending on what your policy says. Um, the, the regulations allow employers to choose between a calendar year and a rolling year. Um, during this time that they are on FMLA leave, they would need to continue with your employee's group health benefits under the same conditions as if they had not taken a leave. Um, most insurance policies or if you talk to the insurance providers, um, have you have the ability to keep those that are on FMLA on your insurance policy. Um, and then the third point is restoring the employee to the same or virtually identical position at the end of the leave period. So you're obligated to give them the leave, keep them on benefits and give them their job back. <laughs> Sums it up under the FMLA. So when you're considering FMLA, that's kind of our national default. That is, that it goes across the U.S. as a national law. However, some states have more expansive paid and unpaid leave laws. So we certainly encourage you, if you are in multiple states, to be very aware of what individual states require. An example is Colorado, the residents earn paid sick leave at a rate of one hour to every 30 hours worked. Um, and in California, residents get to roll over vacation time that's earned. So there can be some uh, state-specific laws that you're going to want to be familiar with. And also, just keep in mind, in our remote work world, you may have an employee who, when they were reporting physically to the office, used to live in North Carolina, but hey, now that you've allowed them to get a remote, they now live in Florida. Um, so you just need to be very aware of where your employees live if they are remote workers so that you're complying with the state laws where they live as well. Um, and then leave can be taken and given um, as if they're in the office, meaning remote work. Like if they're working remote, they're still entitled to, to FMLA leave if they meet all the eligibility requirements. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, if an employee does not take leave when they're sick and their performance suffers, then disciplinary consequences likely can still be given as if they weren't sick. But we will talk a little bit further about what triggers FMLA. And so if you know an employee is sick as an employer, you're, um, they don't again, they don't have to use magic words. If they say, I'm sick, I've, you know, I've I've got cancer and I, I've got, you know, chemotherapy treatments, they don't have to say, and so I need FMLA leave. That is enough information to prompt you as the employer to be aware that they may need FMLA. And it is um, important for you as an employer to zone in on that and do the appropriate paperwork. Because what happens is, let's say you didn't give them the FMLA paperwork, but you said, yeah, you can take six weeks off. But you didn't you didn't call it FMLA. And then the end of the six weeks, the employee says, you know what? I can't come back. And now I need FMLA leave. 
you haven't given them, even though you gave them six weeks leave, you didn't designate it as FMLA, they're still entitled to 12 weeks of FMLA leave. So it is important as an employer um, to recognize when you should be going down the path of, of looking into FMLA leave. So next slide. So focusing again on mental health conditions, so they can be a serious health condition if, and this comes from the statute and regs, if there's inpatient care, overnight stay in a hospital or other medical care facility can trigger FMLA. Also, if there's continuing treatment by a healthcare provider. So conditions that incapacitate an individual for more than three consecutive days and require ongoing medical treatment, that can be medical appointments, um, including a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a clinical social worker or a single appointment and a follow-up care. Um, so in, you know, it could be a telehealth appointment or rehabilitation counseling, behavior therapy, something like that. Or the other option is the chronic conditions, meaning I have anxiety, depression, that's caused by occasional periods when an individual could be incapacitated and require treatment but they're not in constant treatment. It is just as the need arises, but they have a chronic condition. So, and these are very similar to other types of serious health conditions as what could trigger um, FMLA coverage. So here are just some examples for y'all to, to keep in mind. Uh, Karen's occasionally unable to work due to severe anxiety. She sees a doctor monthly to manage her symptoms. She uses the FMLA leave to take time off when she's unable to work unexpectedly due to her condition and when she has a regularly scheduled appointment to see her doctor. So that would be an, a, a time where FMLA is a serious health condition because it's chronic, it's severe anxiety. She sees a doctor on a regular basis. And this would be an example of intermittent FMLA leave because the employee doesn't need to take 12 weeks off. They need to be able to take time off for their appointments or when they are unexpectedly unable to come to work due to their condition. The next example is um, Wyatt uses one day of FMLA leave to travel to an inpatient facility to attend an aftercare meeting for his 15-year-old son. He's just completed 60-day inpatient drug rehab treatment program. And here, this is where it would be to care for a spouse, child, um, who has a serious health condition. So Wyatt doesn't have the serious health condition, but is using FMLA leave to care for his son. Uh, third here is Anastasia uses FMLA leave to care for her daughter. Uh, Alex is 24, recently released from several days of inpatient treatment for a mental health condition. She's unable to work or go to school and needs help with cooking, cleaning, shopping, and other daily activities. So in this instance, even though Alex is technically adult. Um, a parent can still, if the if the child is unable, uh, incapable of self care, then the parent employee can still ask for FMLA leave. So these are just three examples. Um, we're going to get into a little bit more specifics about eligibility and documentation and things like that um, after we talk about workers' compensation laws, and we're going to kind of compare the three. So there's more to come on FMLA. Um, but getting briefly into workers' comp, and sometimes that gets a little forgotten um, when doing an ADA FMLA review. And sometimes workers' comp is in its own world. And we encourage all of um, our clients and employers to consider all three to make sure you're not um, leaving one of these uh, protected leaves out. So workers' comp is a form of insurance that provides financial assistance, medical, um, or other benefits for employees who are injured or disabled on the job. There are going to be state workers' compensation statutes. Um, that generally require employers to compensate the employees for work-related injuries without regard to negligence or fault of the employee or the employer. So each state has their own workers' comp law, and you will need to make sure if your company's in multiple states that you understand the obligation in each state, because it will vary from state to state. But workers' comp, may cover mental health. I think it, you know, when people originally think of 
workers comp, you probably think of when an employee gets hurt at work and you know, falls off a ladder, gets their hand stuck in a machine, you know, something injury at work, but mental health can be impacted. So there's typically two types. You've got occupational disease and you've got injury by accident. Typically, these are the two ways that you could get workers comp as an employee. So an occupational disease is gonna be any disease which is proven to be due to causes and conditions which are characteristic of and peculiar to a particular trade, occupation, or employment. Um, so maybe if you are a coal miner and you might have black lung disease because that is an occupational disease from being a coal miner. Um, and it has to be an increased risk due to the nature of the work. So um, likely ineligible would be anxiety from a conflict with an abusive supervisor, because that's not um, the nature of the work. That's just human beings being difficult. And that can happen anywhere in your life. Um, but Here's an example of something that may be eligible, and that is depression from caring for suicidal patients. Um, if your job is to care for suicidal patients, that may wear on you and you, you may become depressed after a certain period of time. So that could be then eligible as an occupational disease. Injury by accident, employees generally must be able to point to specific accident causing the psychological injury. So um, accident requires unusualness and unexpectedness. Um, so in this instance, it would be likely ineligible if you had a panic attack following a performance review. A performance review is not um, typically going to be seen as an accident or anything out of the ordinary. But you, if you were to, let's say, have PTSD from watching a coworker be killed, that is an incident, a specific incident that they could point to, to say, this caused me to have PTSD and this happened at work. So just keep in mind, not everything will be covered, but it is um, definitely prudent for employers to consider it. So workers' comp laws covering remote work injuries. Um, we just wanted to touch on this briefly in this new world, but most workers' comp laws apply to workers who suffered injury or disease arising in out, out of and in the course of their employment. So this implicates even when you're working from home or another remote location, um, according to OSHA, if it occurs while performing paid work and occurred because of the work performance, not the general home environment, it could be covered. But OSHA doesn't require employee inspection of the home offices, and OSHA typically will not inspect home offices, but you know very well could inspect other home work sites such as a manufacturing space. Employers can be held responsible for those. So it's a challenging analysis if you had, for example, a trip and fall over a pet. You know, while there were rent working, uh, is that because of your home environment, or was that because of your work environment? And so those are some of the tricky questions that are really, um, I would say, not fully fleshed out at this point. You're going to have different states have come down differently. So I don't, there's not an automatic answer, frankly, to that. And it will be very much probably a case by case analysis. So next, as I highlighted, we are going to be talking about the intersection of ADA, FMLA, and workers' comp and discussing certain parameters of all three of them together so that you can kind of see a side-by-side -side comparison. So I will turn it over to Sarah again. Absolutely. Um, so this really is a three-headed monster in a whole lot of different respects, and it's important to think about how they play together. Um, it's one thing to totally get FMLA, but if you forget about ADA and workers' comp, you're going to run into problems. Um, so the first way that all of these overlap is the definition of disability or in the workers comp case a work related injury. So generally speaking, and this is not perfect, generally speaking, the FMLA serious health condition is the broadest category of what things fall into. Then you have ADA disabilities as kind of fitting well within 
the things that may be an FMLA serious health condition. So again, it's very general terms. You may have a serious health condition that's not an ADA disability, um, but most ADA disabilities would be a serious health condition under FMLA. And then workers' comp, it, as Tricia was explaining, has to be work-related in some way. Um, depression from dealing with suicidal patients all day versus depression from a chemical imbalance or other things that are going on in your life. Both of these may be ADA disabilities. Both of these may be serious health conditions. Only one of these is a work-related injury. Um, so we got to think about which laws apply to any given um, disability or injury. Uh, so I'm going to turn it back to Tricia to talk about who's covered by these laws, because yeah. that's also not the same. Yes, yeah, so th we're going to ping pong a bit now. Sarah and I are kind of alternating slides. So who's covered? So you may be covered by the ADA, but you may not be covered by FMLA. Um, so the, the most likely thing that you're going to be covered by is a workers' comp. Because those can apply to businesses with as few as one employee. Uh, the laws vary from state to state, though. So make sure you are looking at each state. In North Carolina, it requires all businesses which employ three or more employees um, to obtain workers' comp, insurance, uh, workers comp insurance. There are a few exceptions, like employees of railroads and um, some others, but if you have less than three in North Carolina, you may not have to have workers comp. Um, ADA is the, the next one, and that is with 15 or more employees. Um, again, though, we caution you to consider broader state laws so in case you're in a state that has some uh, essentially an equivalent to an ADA um, statute. Um, and then FMLA is you've got to be larger to be covered. And it's employers with 50 or more employees in the 20 um, or more work weeks in the preceding calendar year um, are eligible employers under FMLA. Um, and then government and private schools are also incorporated into that. So you may be covered by one, but not all. Or you may be covered by all. It depends on the circumstance and the number of employees. And just to throw a plug in, um, I'm sure y'all all, and we've probably done one or we will be doing one about independent contractors. But when you are counting up your employees, if you have improperly classified an independent contractor that's really an employee, then you may be counting this incorrectly. So it's, um, I put a plug in to make sure if you have independent contractors that you are very comfortable that, and that has been reviewed, that they are truly independent contractors. So next slide, I think. Let's see. So now we're going to look at what employees are eligible. And again, it differs from all three provisions. So in the ADA, it's going to be, um, all disabled employees are eligible so long as they are qualified to, to do the essential functions of their job with or without reasonable accommodation. Um, applicants can also be eligible for ADA protection. So if you have someone that needs an accommodation throughout the application process, you will need to consider that as well. And um, also, and, and this one, it gets tricky because it doesn't always trigger a need for an accommodation, but um, employees that are regarded as having a disability by the employer. So even if they don't really meet the statutory definition, but you treat them as somebody with a disability and consider them, they can also be eligible for protection under the ADA, certain protections. Um, and then in FMLA, it's only employees who work for an employer for 12 or more months. Those do not have to be consecutive, though, and have worked um, 1250 hours or more over the past 12 months. And that is a consecutive time frame um, at a location where the employer has 50 or more employees within a 75 mile radius. So one thing that has become increasingly tricky is when you have somebody working remote and they, um, so you need to look at the office to which they report. 
And if there's a dispute over where they might be reporting, I would factor it in both ways. <laughs> um, and under workers' comp, in many states, all employees are eligible for recovery under the state workers' comp. Um, but again, I encourage you to be familiar with your um, state laws. All right. So then once you've figured out if these laws apply to me and if these laws apply to the person that I'm employing, how much time can the leave be? Uh, so FMLA is the most straightforward. 12 weeks and 12 months. Um, it does not matter whether there is any inconvenience or hardship for the employer. It is 12 weeks and 12 months. Um, that 12 weeks and 12 months, though, can run concurrent with any leave that would go under the ADA or any leave that would go under workers' compensation. Um, and that's important because as Trisha said, if you just give somebody leave, but you don't code it as FMLA leave, then they may get some ADA leave and they may get some workers' comp leave, and then you still owe them 12 more weeks of FMLA leave. So it's really important to classify the leave as FMLA leave if it meets that definition and let it run concurrently with an ADA leave or a workers' comp leave. Um, but importantly, it, it doesn't really matter the impact that it has on your business. Um, the ADA, though, that has to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. There's no magic number of how much leave an employer has to give. It can be short. It can be really long. Um, and in those cases, the employer can think about, does this create an undue hardship on my business? Um, an issue that comes up a lot in mine and Trisha's practice is somebody calling us and saying, hey, my employee has taken 12 weeks of FMLA leave. They say they still need more leave. They're out of FMLA leave. What do I do? Well, the answer is look at ADA and see if they need leave as a reasonable accommodation and if that would pre present an undue hardship for your, for your business and go through that ADA process that I told you about earlier through those those five steps um, to decide whether or not more leave needs to be given under the ADA or not. Um, and then lastly, with workers' compensation, there's not a specific limit on the amount of leave. Usually they're shorter, um, but not always. And especially when it comes to psychological disabilities, they could be long. Um, and in both this case, um, in workers' compensation, you can offer and see if they would want to do remote work you can't require them to take on remote work instead of taking their workers' compensation leave. Um, same thing with FMLA. Remote work is not leave. Um, so if they're able to do remote work, that doesn't count into their FMLA leave. Um, with the ADA, though, when you're undergoing that analysis, depending on the reason the person needs the leave may depend on whether remote work is a reasonable accommodation versus taking a leave. Um, if the reason is you know, they've been dealing with um, a lot of anxiety and they're having anxiety leaving their home. And that's why they need more leave. That's why they can't come back to work. Well, if they can do their job remotely and they don't need to leave their home, um, then that may be a reasonable accommodation as an alternative to leave. Um, so something that can be considered under ADA leave. And I'm going to jump in real quick. With, yeah. when we're talking about alternatives to leave of absence. Um, just keep in mind, like workers comp does have, you know, light duty. And I've had clients actually provide light duty was sitting in a chair, stapling papers together, mainly because their insurance carrier encouraged the light duty because it was a way to not have to pay um, wages for them to sit home. But the EEOC has taken the position that if you offer an alternative accommodation like under workers comp, then you may have to then offer that for those under ADA or for somebody, let's say, who's pregnant, who has a lifting restriction. Pregnancy is not a disability. I can incorporate some disabilities, but generally speaking, it's not a disability in and of itself. But if you had a lifting restriction and you had one employee who had a lifting restriction for workers' comp, and you gave them the light duty to sit at a desk, and then you didn't give the pregnant employee who had a lifting restriction on a light duty offer, then it could be seen as discrimination towards the pregnant employee. That is um, 
I don't necessarily agree with the EEOC on that, but that is a position they have taken in the past. And I just encourage you to be well aware when you give a, an alternative option under one that it could impact what you have to do under the other statutes. Well, not FMLA, but ADA. Yeah, and Trisha, I think that's a really good point that you brought up because um, that can go for in, in within the ADA as well. Um, as we started out, physical disabilities are things that we've been working on accommodating since 1990, since the ADA was passed. Mental health disabilities have been harder um, and are coming more to the forefront in recent years. Um, discriminating among disabilities is the same thing as discriminating on the basis of disability. So if you provide certain accommodations to people who are blind or who use a wheelchair, have other physical disabilities, but not to people with mental health disabilities, um, then you could be violating the ADA. So that's a really good point, Trisha. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, so if you'll go to our next slide, this is what I was saying about the ADA may require um, additional leave, that just because somebody has exhausted their FMLA leave doesn't mean they're done with leave. They may still be entitled to ADA leave um, after the 12 weeks or maybe intermittent leave um, if they have doctor's appointments or they're struggling to get out of bed or um, whatever it is. We still need to engage in that interactive dialogue um, before saying no more leave. Uh, additionally, and so this is our next slide, um, as we said before, remote work is not leave. So it doesn't cut into somebody's FMLA leave but it could be a reasonable accommodation or something to consider um, under the ADA. Uh, that has some pitfalls uh, with remote work. Um, it is harder to hold people accountable. There's less connection with people, but it could be a good alternative. Um, and it's really important to remember that if remote work is used, that you still are complying with um, the FLSA, the Fair Labor and Standards Act, um, and wage and hour laws, because sometimes it's harder for people to keep track of their hours, um, and that will still apply. You know, if they go over 40 hours in a week, overtime still applies. So it's important that if you are considering remote work, that um, you work through all the different implications that remote work can have. All right, so now we're going to talk about reduced or intermittent scheduling, which is probably one of the most frustrating. The request for leave and intermittent scheduling is, um, I find to be some of the frustrating topics for my clients. Um, so under ADA, it could be a reasonable accommodation so long as it doesn't create an undue burden. Um, and you can be flexible so long as it's effective for both the company and the employee. There are going to be times, though, where it would be an unreasonable request because let's say they want to change their schedule and come in at 10 due to whatever disability. Uh, you know, let's say they're depressed and so it takes them longer to get going in the mornings, but they are the forklift driver and Everybody else reports to work at eight, but nobody can do anything until the forklift driver gets there. So that may not be a reasonable accommodation because of the work schedule, but it is something you should definitely explore and look into and engage in that interactive process for. FMLA, it is um, something that employees are entitled to take it intermittently when it's medically necessary. So the employee can be temporarily transferred. Um, and unfortunately, this could cause undue hardship. It could cause hurt feelings within the workplace. It could wreak havoc on your workplace. But that is not a reason that an employer can deny the intermittent leave. So as long as that is medically necessary, and that could be for doctor's appointments, or it could be, you know, somebody has migraines and they only need the leave when they have the migraine. Um, or if they're, you know, depressed and they just go through bouts of depression where it's harder for them to come to work, they may be entitled to F, uh, intermittent leave. Um, and so that the company doesn't have flexibility if a doctor or, or healthcare provider has said they need intermittent leave. Um, then you have workers' comp, and typically workers' comp is going to be 
you know, they're maybe out on leave, but maybe they're having to leave for appointments and things like that. So you could have a situation where they need to leave to get, you know, whatever physical therapy or um, if they are getting counseling for PTSD, something like that, that was work related. It could be that they have some intermittent leave, but generally speaking, if they say they, you know, if they need workers comp leave, it's generally not going to be intermittent or a reduced schedule, but it's something you could offer if that's something the employee would, would rather have. And then the next slide is talking about retaliation and all three are going to prohibit retaliation. So ADA just flat out retaliation is prohibited. So somebody who requests an accommodation, you can't prohibit it. You can't retaliate against them. If somebody has a disability, you can't discriminate against them, but you also can't retaliate against them. Um, FMLA, employers are prohibited from interfering with restraining or denying the exercise of, or the attempt to exercise any FMLA rights. So Here's an easy example where you have an employee who's pregnant or, you know, their spouse is expecting and you just go ahead and terminate them before they have the baby so that you can avoid them getting you, their FMLA leave to care for the, the newborn. That would be seen as interfering with or denying their exercise of FMLA rights and would be retaliation and anticipation. Likewise, if they take FMLA, and you discipline them for not meeting quota, but you didn't factor in the fact that they had this FMLA leave, that could be seen as uh, retaliation for taking FMLA leave. And then of course, just firing someone because they're sick all the time and they're gone all the time could be seen as retaliation for FMLA. So it is important that your managers um, know that they cannot retaliate against employees for any use of these. And of course, if you're the one overseeing um, the decisions to terminate, make sure that FMLA, ADA, workers' comp is never taken into account as a reason or is the precipitating factor for terminating somebody. And in workers' comp, you're also, most states are gonna prohibit. And I say most states, it likely could be all. I just can't sit here today and tell you I've read every single workers' comp state in all 50 states. Um, but in North Carolina, we have the Retaliatory Employment Discrimination Act, which is a statute that prohibits an employer, among many other things, from retaliating against an employee who filed or threatened to file a workers' compensation claim. So um, there are laws that protect them. The next one is Verification. So this is basically what can you ask for? You know, I, an employee has come to me and said they need this leave or they need this intermittent leave. What can we ask for? And um, the different statutes are different. So let's say somebody's coming to you for the first time and it's FMLA coverage. You are you may require an employee to submit a healthcare provider certification to support the need for the FMLA. Um, the certification must be sufficient to support the need for the leave, but a diagnosis is not necessarily required. There are Department of Labor forms, and you can require your employee to have their health care provider fill that out. That is all you are allowed to know at the time while FMLA coverage is out there. So when I'm focusing on ADA, keep in mind if these are running concurrent, if it is the same you know, disability or health condition, you have to go with the least, the most restrictive first. So you first can only ask what FMLA will entitle you to ask. But once FMLA has expired, or let's say FMLA doesn't apply, maybe the employee's only been there for a year. Um, then with under the ADA, medical inquiries are generally prohibited unless job related and consistent with business necessity. Um, so if an employee comes to you and says, I suffer from depression and I need to be able to take you know, intermittent leave as needed, um, you as an employer, that is not an obvious condition. So you are entitled to ask for medical documentation that will, um, address the, the disability and the need for the leave. 
So you can ask for information regarding the disability, the need for the accommodation, but you can't get their whole mental health record. Um, you really have to limit it to what they're requesting. Um, and then you need to limit it to the need to evaluate the impact of the disability on the job. So while you don't have to just take the employee's word for it, um, you definitely can ask for medical documentation. It is a limited universe of what you can ask for. So, so do be careful there. And again, just a reminder, but if the person's also eligible for FMLA, you can only ask for the information provided under FMLA first. Under workers' comp, an employer can require medical information that pertains to the employee's on-the-job injury or illness. A lot of employers have an insurance company that handles a lot of that aspect for them anyway. All right, in our final 30 seconds, I wanna make sure we cover confidentiality. Um, long story short, all medical information should be kept confidential. Um, on a very, very limited need to know basis, um, especially the records. Records should be kept separately from personnel files um, and supervisors, generally speaking, don't need to know the ins and outs of someone's medical history. Um, they need to know the restrictions. They need to know their accommodations. They need to know somebody's gonna be on leave, but they don't need to know, hey, such and such had a nervous breakdown and it is a psychiatric hospital. They just need to know they're on leave. Um, so I'll end with that, that um, in all of this, as you're trying to navigate the ins and outs of these laws, it's all got to stay really close to the vest. Um, employees don't need to know what's going on. Supervisors don't need to know what's on. Um, and it's a violation of the ADA and FMLA to share that information. Um, so with that, thank you all so much for being here, for your attentiveness. Um, it was great chatting with you all. And if you all um, need anything, um, we will certainly be around to, to help you on any way. And Cecilia will email you all the SHRM uh, information so that you can get the credit. Thanks so much. Thank you all. Anybody does want to submit a question to the chat, we can wait uh, to see from anybody in particular. Otherwise, thanks everyone for joining us today. Don't see any questions in the chat right now. So with that, I will say thanks everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.